This is Oannes, the first of the Apkalu sages described in the myths of Mesopotamia. He was a revered figure in the ancient world of Sumer, Babylon, and Akkad. He is but one of seven sages, seven wise men, that were said to be the teachers of mankind. According to various cuneiform inscriptions, Oannes was a civilizing hero, a bringer of culture from before the flood. It is said that in the remotest of antiquity, he mysteriously emerged from the sea to spread the knowledge of civilization. This included writing and mathematics, how to build cities and temples, and various other forms of knowledge like agriculture and legislation. Babylonian literature frequently describes these seven antediluvian sages as conjurers, sorcerers, and magicians. They serve the kings that reigned before the Great Deluge, and are said to have possessed advanced knowledge associated with medicine, carpentry, masonry, and so on. Much more about the Apkalu sages comes from Barosus, who compiled his works from the temple archives of Babylon. He claims that these archives contained historical records that have been preserved for over 150,000 years. This legend on its own is curious enough. A wandering wise man emerging from the sea after a global disaster, bringing the knowledge of civilization to the scattered and distraught survivors of a great deluge? And the myths of Mesopotamia aren't the only place we can find such a figure. Let us go to the other side of the globe and fast forward a few thousand years, to Mexico. It is here where one of the earliest Mesoamerican cultures emerged in roughly 2500 BC, known as the Olmecs. Monument 19 at La Venta showcases the Mesoamerican civilizing deity known as Quetzalcoatl. According to the 16th century chronicler Bernardino de Sahagún, Quetzalcoatl was a great civilizing agent who entered Mexico at the head of a band of strangers. He imported the arts into the country and especially fostered agriculture. He built spacious and elegant houses and inculcated a type of religion which fostered peace. There are several figures like this in Central and South American oral traditions. To the Incas, it was Viracocha, described as a white-skinned and bearded man who came from the East, bringing the knowledge of the arts and sciences. Similar to Quetzalcoatl, both promised to return someday. More curiously, however, is that the indigenous people always describe these sages with very similar physical characteristics, a Caucasian and bearded man, usually wearing a robe. Who were these men, and where did they come from? In Egyptian mythology, Osiris was the god of agriculture and a great king in primordial times, who offered the gifts of civilization to those willing to receive them. Thus, the connection between Osiris, Viracocha, and similar deities becomes clear. The Edfu building texts also speak of the seven sages. According to the Egyptologist Dr. Eve Raymond, who translated the Edfu texts, the seven sages originally came from an island. It was called the Homeland of the Primeval Ones, and goes on to say that this island was destroyed in a catastrophic flood. The Edfu texts further explain how these magical sages wandered the earth in their great ships, seeking to restore all that was lost. We'll come back to the Great Flood motif in a bit. For now, let's return to the image depicted on Monument 19 at La Venta. Perhaps you notice the small handbag that the Serpent Man is holding. This is strikingly similar to the handbags held by the Apkalu sages and there exists no explanation by either culture what the meaning or purpose of these handbags were. To this day, it is still a subject of debate. What has been speculated by various authors and researchers is that it seems that this handbag provides a common link that connects various sages and wisdom bringers around the world, possibly the mark of some kind of initiatory brotherhood. Perhaps if these images of handbags and their association to stories of civilizing deities existed in isolation, then it could just be a coincidence. But there is another place where we can find them. An archaeological site with such profound implications on the story of human history 
that it has called the entire narrative into question. I'm talking about Gobekli Tepe, of course, and thanks to the work of the German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt, we can confidently say that this is the oldest megalithic site in the world, with the oldest parts being carbon dated to roughly 9600 BC. What makes this dating so certain is that this site was deliberately buried after an unknown duration following its construction. By burying this site, it prevented the intrusion of later organic materials that could have given a falsely younger date. So we can be absolutely sure that this site is at least 11,600 years old. Similar to the works of the Egyptians, the oldest part of this site bears the most advanced and sophisticated craftsmanship, featuring limestone blocks weighing up to 16 tons, decorated with high-relief carvings and a myriad of animals and much more, Gobekli Tepe would have been a colossal undertaking for the so-called hunter-gatherers that supposedly built it. What concerns us here is found within Enclosure D on Pillar Number 43. More handbags. This handbag iconography, which not only appears to be a symbol for wisdom, the keepers of knowledge, and the bringers of civilization, that also appears in the codices of the far-off indigenous people of the Americas, can now be identified as a symbol that has existed for nearly 12,000 years. What was the purpose of this place? And what happened during this epoch that compelled these people to undertake a project of this scale, only for it to be buried shortly after? This date of 9600 BC, as a matter of fact, marks a significant moment in the Earth's history. It is the end of the Ice Age. More specifically, it is the end of the Younger Dryas, the sudden and rapid return to glacial conditions in approximately 12,800 BC after a brief period of global warming. The Younger Dryas ended in an equally sudden return to the habitable temperature we experience today. This event marked the transition from the Pleistocene into the Holocene, the present-day geological epoch. Adding further significance to this ominous date is that 9600 BC is the exact date that Plato claims the legendary city of Atlantis sank into the sea. In his Timaeus and Critias, he tells us that Atlantis sank 9000 years before Solon, the Athenian statesman who lived in 600 BC. 9000 years minus 600 BC gives us a date of 11,600 years before the present. This is the exact window of time when the Younger Dryas cold spell came to its catastrophic end. If there ever were a time when a Golden Age civilization could have been completely and utterly destroyed, it would certainly have been here. The cause of these rapid changes in climate was likely due to a comet or a series of comet fragments that collided into the ice sheets of North America. It would have been a global event, causing unimaginable catastrophe and floods, and is likely the source of the thousands of flood myths from around the world. The fact that literally every culture has a flood myth should prompt us to reconsider how we define a myth. In a previous video, I explained how the cross-cultural prevalence of serpent symbolism might have represented the Earth-destroying comet. I won't repeat the details here, but rather mention that there are numerous depictions of serpents at Gobekli Tepe as well. The comet, with its long, fiery tail as it soared across the sky, may have appeared serpentine in form. There is more strangeness to all of this, so much more. For one, knowing that Gobekli Tepe was deliberately buried immediately after this long period of disastrous climate is deeply puzzling. Were the builders trying to create a time capsule containing a message to the future? If so, what might this message have been? Was this some kind of post-apocalyptic gathering center where the survivors of the deluge sought to re-establish the knowledge and skills lost after the cataclysm? When dealing with ancient texts and structures that are quite literally hoary with age, as Graham Hancock would say, much of it is simply lost to time. 
We are a species with amnesia, after all. Besides, God only knows what we've lost in the destruction of countless libraries and archives over the course of history, along with all the texts and artifacts hidden away in the Vatican archives, of which the public is strictly forbidden to see. All things considered, there are many convincing theories about Gobekli Tepe and what its purpose might really have been. Based on the pillar's imagery and their astronomical alignments, it may be the earliest known use of astrology. It may also have been the Temple of the Watchers, who were the angels that descended to Earth and mingled with humans, as described in the Book of Enoch. There simply is not enough time here to explain any of these further in any depth, so I'll have to stop there. I'll be exploring more of the anomalies related to Gobekli Tepe and other ancient sites in the next few videos, along with the idea of lost knowledge embedded in the world's mythologies. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Till next time, stay curious. Peace.